there was a sort of grassroots uprising, which then organized around a call by a young woman, Randy Forsberg, for a freeze on the nuclear arms race. It climaxed in 19, June 1982 in a meeting in, in Central Park and then a march to the UN of a million people. Jeez. And among those people was me and a million other people. <laughs> When recording the Black Sea Experiment episode, I went to Princeton's program on science and global security to speak with Frank von Hippel. This was a real treat for me, since I usually record podcasts online. I had never been to Princeton, and I had never actually met Frank. Frank is a giant in the fields of arms control, at least a physicist. He is a prolific writer. In fact, I joked that every question I asked him in email or in person was answered but also included a paper he wrote. Frank is also active in the Physicist Coalition for Nuclear Threat Reduction, which already has a thousand physicists signed up. You might remember this group from episode 31, Nuclear Threat Reduction and Current Events, with Matthias Gross Perdikem. In this episode, we're going to move away from the Black Sea experiment and onto some of the other work that Frank is passionate about. I want to start actually a little further back than you probably think, which is you're a physicist. And how does a physicist get involved in nuclear arms reduction? I actually have to even go back to my grandfather. Oh, the- wow. Okay. Go, far, <laughs> go as far back as you need to. My, my grandfather was James Frunk. I'm sorry, your grandfather was James Frunk? Yeah, my mother's father. Yeah. Wow. And and he was involved in the Manhattan Project, mm-hmm. atomic physicist, and at the University of Chicago. And he had signed up only on the basis that if the time came to for a decision to use a nuclear weapon, he would be able to give his views on that to the highest authorities. So on that basis, he was allowed to organize a group to write a report on what they thought about the the implications of the nuclear weapons would be. And and they focused especially on the danger of a post-World War II nuclear arms race with the Soviet Union. And they urged that the bomb not be used on Japan except as a result of consultation with the United Nations, which had just been established. And this is the famous Frank Frank report. report. Yeah. And, of course, their advice was not heeded. (laughs) I didn't know much of this story from my grandfather. Niels Bohr was a family friend, a friend of my grandfather's, and would visit us where I grew up, outside Boston. I got the impression that they were, that this was a pretty significant issue. At first, I had to become a famous physicist in order to, to be listened to. So I started work on that, and then when I was an assistant professor at Stanford in the late 60s, and not contributing that much, in my view, not to the amount of work I was doing, it was not resulting in that much advances to the field. Uh, The Vietnam War came. The students rose up against the the, Vietnam War, especially the draft. And I was pulled in by some students who, who organized Stanford workshops on social and political issues, a group of student-initiated workshops. One of the students was Joel Premack, a physicist, and his his thesis advisor was Sid Drell. Sid Drell, unbeknownst to me at the time, was the chairman of the Strategic Weapons Panel of the President's Science Advisory Committee. And Joel asked him, well, I'm sure you guys are giving good advice with why is the policy so so terrible? And Sid said to him, well, I'm sorry, it's all classified. And so Joel said, okay, I'll find out. So he set up a workshop on science advising to understand what the impact of science advising was. That workshop ended up going two semesters. He started with Marty Pearl, who was, who was a experimental physicist at Stanford, and, and then Pearl, I think, went on sabbatical and asked me to be the advisor for the second semester. The workshop had a really 
major impact. It actually was the origin of the Congressional Science Fellowships. They proposed the Congressional Science Fellowships, which now more than 200 physicists a year go to work for Congress and for the executive branch as a result of those fellowships. But they didn't answer the question that Joel was asking about science advising. What's the matter with science advising? And, And so he and I undertook to do some research on that. We spent the summer on that and wrote a report, which was printed up by Stanford and put in a closet. But then somebody, a a reporter from, I think, the San Francisco Examiner came down and wanted to do a story on on these workshops. Mm -hmm. And they gave him a copy of our report. And he thought it was sensational. And he put it out on the Associated Press, stories all over the world about the problems we had discovered about science advising being misused to legitimize policies that the scientists had advised against. At that time, the, the, the science advising process was confidential. And so eventually the reports would come out, but long after the damage was done. I was going to say, what did you find was the problem with science advising? That, that it was confidential? That it, that it was being used to legitimize policies which the scientists did actually not support. Basically, the line was, we've consulted the greatest scientists, and we've come to decided to do X. And X wasn't necessarily what the scientists had advised. Ah. And, and so I even have a, a copy of the front page of the National Enquirer. <laughs> we, were, we were on. Uh, you, wait, you were on the National Enquirer? We were, our report was on the front page over a picture of Jackie Onassis and, and, and Carolyn. So that should be on your CV, <laughs> right? That you, you were on the National Enquirer above Jackie Onassis. Well, we were the headline. They headline were the and National Enquirer. <laughs> now that is something else. I don't know any other academic that is on the front page. Has made of, that. <laughs> has made the National Enquirer. I'll send you a a PDF if you like. That'd be fantastic, yes. I think that'd be great. We recommended that that science advisors not put up with this, that if if they find that their advice is being misused, that they go public. And we were told that this was during the President Nixon's time, Mm -hmm. and we were told that that they were admonished, the science advisors would admonish not to take our advice or, you know, to quit if they were inclined to take our advice. And in fact, Nixon abolished the President's Science Advisory Committee. So then there were no scientists advising. For a while, there were no scientists advising the the president directly, right? Uh, when did that change then? Because, I mean, now we have well, it science advisors. it was brought advisors. back in an attenuated form, maybe even by President Ford. We have, you know, President Science Advisor. I, I spent a year and a half in working for the President's Science Advisor under Bill Clinton. And there is a committee, but it's nowhere near what the, the President's Science Advisory Committee was, you know, the clout that they had before Nixon. Yeah. Mm. So anyway, the, the, this response to our report inspired us to write a book. <laughs> you are a prolific writer. Every time I ask you a question, you send me three articles. <laughs> <laughs> is that right? Okay. Yeah. I mean, which I like. Yeah. I'm just saying I've yeah. never met someone who's written so many different articles uh, about uh, so many different things in so many different places. So what's this book that you wrote about? Well, it was called Advice and Dissent, Scientists, <laughs> in, the, scientists in the Political Arena. And it was first case studies of how science advising had been misused. But then the, the second half was that you don't have to be a famous scientist to be listened to. We, we discovered non-governmental organizations, which were just coming up in that period and found that they were having a real impact. And yet, at young scientists straight out of their PhDs, like Tom Cochran, were actually having an impact because they were going directly to the press. And so this was different than what you had been brought up to believe, that you had to first make your you know, name in physics, yeah. and then you could go on to government. Right. And, and so this freed me from having to struggle to become a famous scientist. And so had you always wanted to go into the governmental arena? You just thought you had to Well, yeah, I was first. always interested in policy. It was not very clear exactly. You know, I was not clear on how I, I thought I had to wait on, to be invited. But what happened, and to complete my transition, what, what happened is, so on the way to writing this book, we wrote an article in Science 
magazine called Public Interest Science about the NGOs. Uh, and at that time, Ralph Nader was promoting the idea of public interest law for young lawyers. So we picked up that, that moniker. I received a call from the National Academy of Sciences. Mm -hmm. And and they said, we would like to straighten you out. Oh. <laughs> Why don't you come in, in, on a fellowship to the National Research Council for a year and see how it really happens? Oh, so, so come to our side. Yeah. So I went there, but I didn't find it very interesting. And Joel got me involved in something else. Businesses were in an in activist state because of the Vietnam War as well. The APS, the American Physical Society, was considering sponsoring summer studies on policy issues. Hmm. And so on Joel's suggestion, I was invited to organize a summer study on summer studies. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and we looked at different options that summer. And, and the following summer, I organized one of the options that, that we had looked at, which is on reactor safety, which was a big issue at that time because that was the period when when all the nuclear power plants that we have today were being built and each nuclear power plant was inspiring a not in my backyard yep. uprising. So it turned out, I mean this is a long story. I am enjoying okay. it. All right. It turned out that the Atomic Energy Commission, which was just in in that period actually dismantled into the Department of Energy and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. But they had been struggling to try to explain to the public that not to worry about reactor safety issues. Mm -hmm. And just then they put out a draft, their latest attempt, which is called the Reactor Safety Study, a huge thing, that, that big, including appendices. So we reviewed the draft, and that turned out to be the summer study. And the argument that they made was that the probability is very low. They had been, in previous studies, that they'd been argument, making the argument that the consequences would be very low, but that hadn't worked out. Right. And so they were arguing the probability was very low, and, and then they focused on not the cancers, but on high-dose consequences near the reactor, and they compared those with plane crashes and things like that. Was that more successful? No, <laughs> partly because of us. <laughs> My colleagues focused on the probabilities, and they said, you know, they're much more uncertain than have been calculated here. I focused on the consequences. Mm -hmm. And and I found, and, and on the cancer consequences in particular, and they had calculated those all in, in an appendix nobody would even look, look at. And I found much higher consequences than they, cancer consequences than they calculated and I was trying. I tried to figure out why, and I realized that they had assumed they had calculated that the radiation doses only for one day. They had assumed that people would be evacuated after one day, mm. but most of the cancers would occur at very low probabilities, far downwind, but cumulatively dominant, and there was no way you could e evacuate those people. And so. Our report made a splash. Actually, at, at that time, the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was just being started. In fact, they, they were responsible for the final version of the report. And there was an, over, an active oversight by Congress at that time. Morris Udall was the chairman of the new oversight committee, and he decided to have a hearing on this. And as a result, he asked the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to do a review in the light of the critiques. And then I was part of the review, the NRC's review committee. I was initially the minority member, the critic, but you know, finally one of the other members said, can anybody tell me anything that they did right? <laughs> and, and so the Nuclear Regulatory Commission actually issued a statement that, that certainly the summary was not a, it did not adequately represent the, situ the facts. So and anyway, it, in the meantime, a colleague of mine who was making a similar career transition was setting up a Center for Energy and Environmental Studies at Princeton. Who was that? Rob Sokolow, who actually co-led one of the other studies, the Energy Efficiency Study, which was a very important study that the APS did that same summer, sponsored that same summer. Rob invited me to come to Princeton. 
So that's how I, and then I, I, I sort of made, when in Princeton, I was a colleague here who was working on nuclear weapons proliferation. I, I began working with him, and then as a result of the fact that India had just exploded a, its bomb that spring as a result of an Atomic Energy Commission program to help them with their breeder reactor program. And then later on, really, especially due to the freeze, nuclear weapons freeze movement, I transitioned to working on nuclear arms control in the 80s. Yeah. So you did become a famous physicist. Well, <laughs> or infamous, you know. <laughs> well, one or the other. Yeah. But do you have a report named after you, like your grandfather? No, no, I didn't. Not didn't, yet. Didn't make that. Yeah. Not yet. Yeah. So how did you become the president of the Federation of American Physicists? I was the chairman, not the president. The chairman. President. So chairman. how did you the, become the elected chairman? Chairman. Well, what happened at, to the Federation of American Scientists, which was established by the young physicists who came out of the Manhattan Project, and which had a a major impact early on in defeating the proposal to keep all nuclear research under the military mm -hmm. and and led to the establishment of the Atomic Energy Commission, which sort of lost its way later on. They then, you know, went back to work, the laboratories and the universities. And, and then later on, some of them, the, the most outspoken of them were subject to the McCarthy investigations mm -hmm. and so on. In the 1970s, they they got a new full time CEO president, uh, Jeremy Stone, who revived revived the FAS, and we got to know each other. And he decided I should be the chairman of the FAS, and and put me out as I, I think there must have been a competitive election, but okay, uh, that but, doesn't but, sound like a competitive election. But somehow I was elected chairman. You know, at that time the FAS had about five thousand members, so. So that's how I became the chairman. So I want to switch gears a little bit to something that was perhaps not so successful. Mm -hmm. And it seems like something you've spent a lot of your career on, which is the fissile material yeah. cutoff treaty. Why have you spent so much time on this? Well, it dates back to the, the freeze movement, the nuclear weapons freeze movement of the early 1980s. And that just to give you a little background, yes, because please. it's mostly forgotten, I think, was an uprising during the early Reagan administration against the nuclear arms race, a grassroots uprising. What happened is President Reagan was under the influence of a group called the Committee on the Present Danger. Wait, Committee of the Present? On the Present Danger, which was organized to warn the country that the Soviet Union was ahead in the nuclear arms race and that the Soviets thought that they could fight and win a nuclear war. Oh. And, and those folks came in with Reagan, and he appointed them to high positions, and he was on their board. Reagan was on their board of directors, especially in the, in the Department of Defense. And they proposed a huge U.S. buildup, 10,000 new warheads for an accurate missiles, accurate enough to, to take out this, uh, the Soviet, all the Soviet military nuclear targets in a first strike. And they talked about fighting and winning a nuclear war. Sorry, this look on my face is like, oh my God, this, is, <laughs> this sounds horrible. <laughs> it was horrible. Yeah. And, and it scared people. It, scared, it scares and, me in, yeah. in retrospect. And there was a sort of grassroots uprising, which then organized around a call by a young woman, Randy Forsberg, who was an MIT graduate student, for a freeze on the nuclear arms race. It climaxed in 19, June 1982 in a meeting in, in Central Park and then a march to the UN of a million people. Jeez. And among those people was me and a million other people. <laughs> and I have a picture of that march in my memoir with a banner from the group from Ver Vermont. And the banner says, 193 out of 197 towns in Vermont have voted for the nuclear weapons freeze. That was a real gr grassroots movement. And that, I think, actually is the backstory 
of the story I've told you so far, because I think that the Soviets thought the U.S. was run, at least in this area, by the military industrial complex. And here they saw a opposition movement, which was powerful enough so that Reagan abandoned the buildup and first went to Star Wars and then ultimately to arms control. Anyway, I got excited about it, and Jeremy Stone got excited about this movement and thought, how can we help it? Mm. And my personal thing, well, is what, what do I know about? You know, I know about fissile materials. Mm -hmm. And so maybe we can include in, in the ending the arms race a ban on the production of fissile materials. And I worked on that and published an, an article in Scientific American, which was much more impactful. Well, maybe it'll be impactful again after today. But in those days, it was the ultimate forum for arms control proposals. And actually, you know, one of the questions was how much fissile material does the Soviet Union have? How much does the U.S. have? Well, the, it was secret in both countries, but it was, but in fact, there was other information that had been published that may, allowed me to figure out how much material the U.S. had produced. In, in the case of the highly enriched uranium, it's, it's just how much enrichment work had been done. Yeah, so and, this paper is in Scientific American 1985. So the estimates that you have are from 1985. I think that's right. And then the question was, how much had the Soviet Union produced? And I was not able to do anything on the highly enriched uranium, but I was able to figure out how much plutonium they had produced from looking at the amount of krypton-85 in the atmosphere. Krypton-85 is a, I think, 11-year half-life isotope that is released when, when you reprocess this noble gas, very difficult to capture, and they, they just released it to the atmosphere. And, and then from the, my estimate of the U.S. reprocessing and the published data on the reprocessing in Europe, I was able to subtract that amount of Krypton-85 and see how much Krypton-85 the, the Soviet Union had, uh, had, had produced. So at that time, the Scientific American had and still, I think, has editions in other languages, including Russian. And Kapitsa was the publisher of the Russian edition. But they didn't publish my article. They didn't publish your article in Russian? In Russian. And so I went and I asked them, what's going on here? He says, well, the censors won't let us because there's the amount of plutonium that the, that the Soviet Union has produced is secret. <laughs> <laughs> and you want to publish it? They're secret. Well, I said, it's not the secret anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so then Velikov went, and it went to them and said, Gorbachev says you can publish it. And so they, pub they published it, but two years later. <laughs> so it's a it's a nice graph in in here your calculation of the krypton and how much plutonium then does each country well did each country have in 85 about 100 tons each so to me that seems like a lot yeah and the and the soviet union was still producing we had we had stopped uh and so how many warheads is that well 100 tons is i've estimated that in the in a warhead, there's, there's about three kilograms. And I did that by dividing the number of warheads by, by the number, amount of plutonium, but I was accused of revealing U.S. secrets when yeah, I did. Of course. <laughs> and so that would be enough of, for about 30,000, which is about what we had at, at the peak. One would argue that's enough. Yeah. And the Soviet Union kept producing, and they, they have, you know, I, I forget, maybe... maybe 50 or 80 more tons than we did produce. And so they, they went up to a higher level. So the argument of the, the cutoff treaty is that we just stopped producing. Yeah, now. and we did stop producing because at the end of the Cold War, we started reducing the number of warheads. And so there was excess, now we, the problem was excess plutonium and, and highly enriched uranium. Which is another story, but, but well, what do we do with the excess? Well, plutonium? in the in the case of highly enriched uranium, Tom Neff proposed that we should buy the Soviet excess, so it wasn't lying around, and have them blend it down to low enriched uranium to fuel U.S. nuclear power plants, and the result was for twenty years half of U.S. nuclear power was fueled by excess Soviet weapons uranium. 
That seems like a success. An amazing story, yeah. I think it's the biggest non-governmental initiated thing that I'm aware of. That's amazing. Yeah. So with any sort of treaty, you need verification. How would you verify that each country was not producing plutonium? We finally do have a verification agreement bilateral verification agreement. We haven't gotten an international agreement, but I'm not sure whether it's a treaty, but it's an agreement between the U.S. and, and I think at that point, it was probably Russia rather than the Soviet Union to shut down the production reactors. Okay. And it's actually easy. To, I mean, I think it involved the possibility of visits, but it's easy to do this remotely by looking at the infrared and seeing that there's no heat being generated. By That's these. it? You just simply look and make sure there's no heat being generated from a and the, production reactor? From And then you know it's off. That's easy. Yeah. There are three which are underground. And there, but there you could actually, the cooling water went into the river, and you could actually see the thermal plume. And, and in the winter, you could see that the ice was not, there was no ice downstream from the that exit. So could you hide one? Well, that's what they had done to to, to hide them. You know, they, to, I don't know. They, maybe they thought we they wanted to produce plutonium after the next world war or something like that, and so that they protected these three from deep enough so that they might survive a nuclear bomb. So, are we still producing plutonium for weapons? No, and and we're actually not producing plutonium for any purpose. We that's another story. Which I what the other story? The other story is the the first fight I was involved with after I came to Princeton was was ending the U.S. plutonium breeder program, breeder reactor program, which which was a justification for for plutonium separation around the world, including in India. So, do we have a cutoff treaty? A fissile no, we cutoff have treaty? a moratorium. So we have a moratorium. So your work is almost done. Well, moratorium except in a few countries. Well, not more than a, well, a few countries. Countries that are still producing plutonium for weapons are India, Pakistan, well, plutonium and highly enriched uranium. India, Pakistan, North Korea, Israel, maybe, and now China. And so the negotiating forum for multinational treaties has been the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva. Okay. The last treaty they negotiated was the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty in 1996. Oh, the that fist- was a long time ago. Yeah, the Fissile Material Cutoff Treaty was next. It was the UN General Assembly voted that they should uh, negotiate a Fissile Material Cutoff Treaty. But the Conference on Disarmament operates by, on consensus, not majority vote. and. Russia and China initially objected to that being the priority. They wanted to, because of Star Wars, they wanted to negotiate a treaty on the prevention of an arms race in outer space. They didn't, and the U.S. didn't want to want that, even well after the Reagan administration had abandoned that. So that held up things for a while, and then they agreed that you know the fissile material cutoff treaty could go forward, but then Pakistan objected. Pakistan said, we're behind India, and unless part of the treaty is to make India's stockpile at the same level as ours, we're not going to do it. Uh-huh. And then and then I think later China backed up Pakistan. And because China decided, as we've seen, to build up beyond the level at which, I mean, Chinese whispered in my ear that they had stopped producing. They did stop producing in 1987. But then now I think they are, they decided to restart production as part of, to part of the buildup that they're, that they're, they've, they've launched. So this sounds extremely frustrating. Yeah. No, I visited the ambassadors in Geneva a couple of times and had dinner with them and they were almost in tears of frustration. Basically not being able to do anything for now it's it's almost 30 years. Yeah. Is that why you got out of government? No, no. I was in government for a year and a half. 
Princeton gave me leave for two years, but even after a year and a half, I figured that they had ex accepted all my ideas that they were going to accept and, and rejected all my ideas that they weren't going to accept and there was no point in staying on. Mm. Looking back at your career, what is something that you want to still accomplish? <laughs> What's no. your one thing that you wish you could you could get done? I'm still for the the whole the whole thing. And uh, what's and the whole thing? And you've just met Zia Mia. There's this movement in the south, mostly in the southern hemisphere, for a treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Uh, Zia is the co-chair of their science advisory committee. You know, of the of about seventy countries that have ratified that treaty and. And they're having a, a meeting at the end of November, their second meeting at the, since the treaties come into force for the, those countries in, at the UN at the end of this month. Right now, that's, that's the biggest hope. That's the biggest source of pressure. And we'd like to help them. And so my, my thought is, you know, so far it's only non-weapon states that have signed up. But my thought is that there are 32 countries non-weapon states under the U.S. nuclear umbrella, and we've got to turn them around. They're part of the support structure for the U.S. nuclear deterrent. And, 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 and currently, our, the effort is to get them to at least be observers mm. at the meeting. A few of them actually did, were observers at the first meeting, Germany, Netherlands, Norway, Australia. You just got to get rid of these things. They're, I mean, the fact that that we have, that we're still here, having this conversation is a mir is a, almost a miracle, and and you know we just can't continue to depend on luck this way. Do you think it's realistic? The U.S. is very attached to its nuclear deterrence. It's it's inexplicable, you know, and it, and and, and it, because we right now the U.S. is conventionally. Dominant. During the Cold War, the Soviet Union had twice as many tanks on the other side of the inter German border as we did. And so we had to, or we did depend on the fact it would turn into a nuclear war. We had 7,000 warheads in Germany, West Germany. We're down to 20 now, so because those warheads became obsolete because of precision guided munitions like the javelin and so on. We can destroy a tank without destroying the towns kilometers or so away. I've seen two administrations, the Obama administration and the Biden administration, try for no first use mm -hmm. and be opposed by the Pentagon. Right. And then the Pentagon speaking through its counterparts in these allied countries, you know, saying, you know, that this is your security that's at stake. You've got to put pressure on, on, the, mm -hmm. on the U.S. So the idea is to put pressure on the allied countries. To get them to revert, to, to explain, get them. explain to them that this is, you know, even Ukraine can hold off Russia. You know, there's no need for nuclear weapons. We should be de-emphasizing nuclear weapons. We should have a no first, starting with a no first use policy, mm -hmm. which de facto, I think the Biden administration has. In fact, they'd even tried for no second use if, if, the, so so, if Russia what's used the, nuclear weapons. What's, what's the idea behind no first use? And I, I haven't heard of no second use. So tell our listeners. No, no first use is saying we will not use nuclear weapons first. And the U.S. already has a policy. We will not use nuclear weapons first on a non-nuclear weapon state. Okay. Okay. So the exception is really Russia and China. Okay. And Obama and then Biden both wanted to accomplish that. And no second use is if Russia used a couple of tactical nuclear weapons in Ukraine. I think the the impulse of the Biden administration would be to to a massive conventional response. You know, just wipe out the Ru Russian military in Ukraine. Instead of going to uh, the instead of nuclear. Going, instead of responding with nuclear and then have the Russians respond to that with nuclear and just uh -huh, blowing uh -huh. up the world. Huh. I mean, this started out as a 
kind of happy, uh, you know, conversation <laughs> down memory lane, and now it's getting very dark. Yeah. Well, um, it is a dark time right now. It is. Yeah. Um, and in fact, right now, you know, I retired from teaching, but I've I've actually come back this semester. I'm I'm co-advising Junior Task Force Policy Task Force on avoiding nuclear war with China and Russia. That seems very important. <laughs> <laughs> So you you were around as a young researcher. I read in your memoirs that they were you were a young researcher during the Cold War, and now, now I'm an old researcher. <laughs> now you're a seasoned <laughs> researcher. How do you compare, kind of during the depths of the Cold War, and the feelings and the the rhetoric around nuclear issues between the depths of the Cold War and now? Well, it, it's it's not as bad, but it's getting worse. I mean, and and I think the notion. Well, I mean, of course, Putin has made it worse by threatening to use nuclear weapons if he doesn't get his way, or if the NATO get in, interferes with beyond a certain unknown threshold with him getting his way in Ukraine. And now we have a Chinese buildup and a confrontation with China over Taiwan, which. Maybe even more dangerous. We don't have a two-body problem anymore. Right. Right. <laughs> Sorry, taking it back to physics. Yeah, right. <laughs> so that surprises me because, I mean, your your response, because I think it's very, very bleak right now. And you're saying that it's not as bleak as during the Cold War. Well, you know, during the Cold War, we almost went nuclear. You know, we really got closer to going nuclear than we are now. You know, we, there was, you know, famously the Cuban Missile Crisis, right. but there was also actually a crisis that, that occurred the same month that I went to Moscow the first time. This is the uh, Abel Archer story. I don't know whether you're familiar with that. I am surprisingly not. This was in November, early November. Annually, NATO has a, has a nuclear exercise. Mm -hmm. And this one was in a time of, this was in the early Reagan administration. Andropov was the general secretary. He'd been the head of the KGB in the Soviet Union. You know, the early Reagan administration really got them paranoid. They were looking for signs, you know, of U.S. preparations for a first strike, including whether the blood banks were being built up over here in preparation for a war. So the KGB was looking to see if we were stocking up blood? Yeah. <laughs> That's drastic. And, and any other signs, that, that you know, all sorts of signs. And so here was this NATO exercise, and it went beyond previous exercises, including flying troops from the U.S. to, to Europe. And it ended all the way up to a command exercise on using nuclear weapons on East, Eastern Europe. And the, the, the Soviets thought this was for real. And they began to load up nuclear warheads on their fighter bombers to preempt our, preempt our first strike. Oh, my God. <laughs> and we detected this. And our intelligence people detected this and, and detected their thing. And the question is how we would respond. And, and we had an intelligence guy who said... I would advise not responding. <laughs> and then the exercise ended, and it was over. The crisis was over. Uh, but when I when I went to Moscow, there were there were headlines about U.S. preparations for a nuclear attack in Pravda and so on. And you know when we went down to to Georgia, you mentioned you went to Georgia for in this first meeting. John Holdren and I, who John was the vice chair of the Federation of American Scientists, and he later he became a science advisor. And I, we went on a hike up a local hill, hill, and 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 somebody detected that we were speaking English and that we were Americans, and said, "Why do you want to attack us?" I mean, it was really Belkov was seemed to be relatively unconcerned, but the the, the populate it was real. Concern in the in, in the in the population, and actually on the eve, while we were flying to Moscow, the day after 
movie was shown on oh, US television. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then they showed it on the Russian TV. And they asked me to, to be on Russian national TV what I thought of the messages was. The message is, don't start a nuclear war. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and this was not long after the, the Soviets shot down the Korean airliner. So it was, it was really a, a peak. So things can get worse. Yeah. What do you think the role of, I guess, scientist is? My answer to this is that often, I mean, that, that in fact, good political ideas don't require the physicist. But then often people say, ideally, in an ideal world, that would be a good idea, but there are technical problems. Mm. And so one of our tasks is to, you know, like Teller did with the test ban, you know, pre preventing a test ban for 30 years with, with his evasion scenarios. So th those, are, those are people, physicists can think about those objections and deal, deal with them. The, the other thing is that sometimes, and I've seen it more in other areas than in arms control, is a third way to deal with the issue. And I first first came on this in the nuclear reactor safety issue, where the anti-nuclear groups were saying nuclear power is too dangerous. The nuclear utilities were saying, well, it's that or freeze in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> and some colleagues, including Rob Sokolow, who I mentioned, and Bob Williams, said, well, you know, there's a third way, which is energy efficiency. And so the predictions that were being made in those times for the amount of electricity consumption in, these, in this country are several fold over, actually, the level of, of electricity consumption we have. That has made the energy problem much easier to, to deal with as a result of energy efficiency. Things like LEDs. Before 1970, electricity consumption was growing twice as fast as the, as the economy. And the utilities were projecting that that would continue. Well, it didn't continue. And, and in fact, this was a part of an involvement I had with the Breeder pro Program during the Carter administration. I was part of a the second issue after the reactor safety that I got involved in. We argued that the Breeders' reactors were, shouldn't be, a uh, basically, Glenn Seaborg, who was the head of the At Atomic Energy Commission during, for, for a decade was promoting a, what he called the plutonium economy. The world was going to run on, plutonium was going to be the fuel of the future. And, you know, we, we weren't going to need fossil fuels anymore. That was, that was his solution. But the first product of that was the Indian nuclear, well, the, the, the nuclearization of the South Asia, India, and then Pakistan mm -hmm. responding with its own program. And so we said, you, you shouldn't do the a plutonium program, and you don't need to do it because these projections that are being made for nuclear power are just crazy. They'll never be realized. You know, they were projecting for for Iran now, U.S. would have about 2,000 nuclear power plants. We plateaued at 100. Yeah. And that's 20% of U.S. electricity. If you multiply by 20, they were projecting for nuclear power alone four times more electricity production in the U.S. than we make from all sources. So that was projection was made. I, I, I was on this review panel that the Carter administration set up. And that projection was made by the, it, it was actually an intermediate between Atomic Energy Commission and the Department of Energy. There was the Energy Research and Development Administration. Okay. Briefly. And, and so Carter had them do a panel to review the Breeder Program. And Bob Williams, an energy efficiency expert, and I were on that panel, along with Tom Cochran. Tom actually brought us in. Tom comes up a lot. Because some men, well, the NRDC, the a lawyer from the NRDC was on the Council for Environmental Quality. I think he may have done that. They came in and they with a projection like the one I've described. And I said, where'd you get that? And I said, well, we'd rather not say. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, but then the utilities, there were some nuclear utility presidents on the panel. 
And they said, well, we have a, a similar prediction. Well, yeah, they want it to be high. We can tell you how we got it. And they sent me a book. And the book had been done by a, a consulting firm with a proprietary econometric projection with a thousand parameters. And and so I said, well, you know, this must be ba fit to history. So what what did it what is it in history? Then I realized that the history was that the price of electricity had been going down during this 50 years before 1970. And Bob Williams explained that it was economies of scale. They were scaling up the power plants. And so I looked, what are they projecting for the future pr price of electricity? And they were projecting it's continuing to go down. And so I went into the next meeting of this panel and I asked the utility presidents, are you projecting the price of electricity go down? He said, oh no. He says, nuclear power is expensive. <laughs> <sighs> so guess what your model projects? <laughs> oh. So so that's and and that, that's the way it worked out. <sighs> yeah. The price of electricity plateaued and and then in fact electricity consumption hasn't be, because of things like LEDs mm -hmm. hasn't even be, been growing as fast as the economy. What you haven't mentioned and what I find fascinating, someone who's coming at policy from, you know, the scientific side and kind of being out, outside of it is as just a person observing, I didn't realize how much the role of the scientists played in just our everyday science. So you made a, a difference in policy because you had a kind of scientific friendship with people. Yeah. Yeah, that was right. That's exactly right. It was it and, was the collaborators that I've had that and, have really and, made the difference. And I didn't realize how much that mattered in in these policy issues, and that 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 internationalization of science is so important. Right. And in fact, that's why we set up the International Panel on Fiscal Materials, <laughs> <laughs> based on that that insight that that you know we, we this collaboration with the Soviet scientists. So is there something we haven't discussed that you'd like well, to just, mention? Well, I just mentioned the internet, since I mentioned the internet. Yeah, panel, please. Just, that was sort of the follow-on to the, to try to achieve a fissile material cutoff treaty, to end production of plutonium and highly enriched uranium for any purpose, not just for weapons. And well, you know, we have these moratoriums. We still have a Japanese civilian plutonium program and a French civilian plutonium program. But that's about it. Is there a lesson to be learned from the fissile cutoff treaty? Well, it, I mean, the, the treaty... Which doesn't exist. Which doesn't exist. And so most countries have stopped producing because they have more than enough. You know, what is the lesson? <laughs> 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 you know, arms control... My lesson, actually, is is that Things happen when the public is interested. And I've, I've sort of talked about in the arms control area, three uprisings. You know, one was the uprising that led to the atmospheric test ban treaty, yep. uprising against radioactive fallout. The second was the ABM treaty happened not because of the physicists, but because of a misstep by the Army. The first generation of anti-missile missiles were nuclear armed had nuclear warheads, because they didn't have this hit-to-kill technology that we have today. Still doesn't work, but for, for other reasons, for, because of decoys and things like that. Including the biggest nuclear weapon that was ever tested underground. Was a five, there was a five megaton warhead on the long-range extra... Which one was... Which test was that? That was the Amchitka test. They, could, they tested it under the Aleutian Islands. And then there was, that was actually one of our studies in our book of advice and dissent with the, the scientists were warning that that might cause a tsunami. Mm. Anyway, so the army decided, you know, we want to defend the cities. Let's put these missiles in the suburbs. Oh. And that caused a NIMBY. Yeah, I you know. think that's a reasonable <laughs> NIMBY. <laughs> <laughs> and that caused a NIMBY uprising. And Congress noticed, and they said, well, these scientists have been arguing against 
Lucy missile defense. Maybe we should maybe we should learn more about what they're saying. Uh huh. And that led to congressional pressure, especially in the Senate, and and especially from the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, which has sort of a, been a nothing for many years, but was powerful in those days under William Fulbright. They had hearings on this, and the Senate actually each year the margin Senate votes to pass the appropriations for the ballistic missile defense fell to and to on the in the Nixon administration it was fifty fifty with Vice President Agnew breaking the the tie and Nixon knew that next year he would lose. And that's why he decided to negotiate the ABM Treaty. So it was it was the uprising. And then the third uprising with the nuclear weapons freeze movement. So we need an uprising to get congressional attention. Thank you for listening, and a special thanks to Frank for his hospitality at Princeton and the Stanley Center for Peace and Security for partial sponsorship of this episode. You can find more information on the podcast website, mynuclearlife.com. Until next time, I'm Shelley Lesher, and this has been My Nuclear Life.